Okay, hi everyone. Um, welcome to uh, Caltech Wise Social Activism Speaker Series. Um, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, and I want to quickly say, um, if you're interested in joining uh, the group um, that invites speakers through this series, um, please email uh, or contact us at caltechy at uh, caltech.edu. Um, so we are very fortunate today to have um, Daryl West with us. He is the Vice President and Director of Governance Studies at the Brookings Institution. Um, prior to Brookings, he was Director of the Taubman Center for Public Policy at Brown University. Um, he's written many books, um, won many awards, and uh, his latest is called uh, Turning Point Policymaking in the Era of Artificial Intelligence, which we'll, he'll be discussing today. So without uh, further ado, I'll turn it over to Daryl. Oh, and I just wanted to mention, um, at any point, if you have a question, please uh, put it into the Q&A, and then uh, we'll, um, you don't have to wait till the end to put a question in there, but we'll get to it um, in the Q&A session. All right, thanks. Okay, uh, thank you, Eliza. It's great to be here virtually at Caltech, although I know the uh, students and staff are spread all around the country and probably around the uh, world, but uh, certainly appreciate all of your interest in artificial intelligence. Uh, there are lots of exciting changes uh, taking place in technology, uh, but of course, it's also raising a lot of uh, problems. So, Eliza mentioned uh, the new book I have out with uh, Brookings President John Allen about AI. It's entitled Turning Point. And John and I wrote this book because we think AI is the transformative technology of our time. It's being deployed in sectors from healthcare and education to transportation, e-commerce, and national defense. So in the book, we present in-depth case studies of AI, and we look at the opportunities and risks in each of those areas. And we came up with the title of Turning Point. Uh, because we argue that we are at a major inflection point uh, between utopia and dystopia, and the crucial variable in determining the future is public policy. So Brookings is a public policy organization, and so in the book we present a detailed policy blueprint for going uh, forward. And we argue that if we take appropriate actions, uh, we're actually very confident about the future of technology and the future of technology in society. But if we don't get things right, uh, things could go off the rails uh, pretty uh, quickly. And so uh, what I'd like to do uh, today is just do a very short uh, presentation, uh, hit a few of the uh, key points uh, from the book, uh, but I'd really like to uh, engage with you, uh, hear your comments, hear your uh, questions, uh, because I always learn a lot from uh, the questions that uh, people ask. Uh, so I'll start with the obvious question of what is AI, and we have a whole chapter in our book on that uh, topic. Uh, everybody's heard the term, but many people don't really know uh, what it means. So we define AI as automated software that analyzes data, text, and images, and then makes decisions uh, based on uh, that information. The key qualities are software that is intelligent, adaptable, and learns as it gets new information. And it's really the adaptability and the learning that distinguishes it from other kinds of software that are not dynamic or are more mechanical uh, in their approach. Uh, we give a number of examples in the book just to explain how it's being deployed. So for example, the transportation area is a, a big area for artificial intelligence, uh, the whole rise of autonomous uh, vehicles. Uh, AI is what integrates the information from the LIDAR, uh, from the uh, various uh, cameras and the remote uh, sensors. Uh, and so autonomous vehicles are all about the uh, AI. Uh, without uh, AI, uh, those uh, vehicles uh, could not operate. Uh, finance is another area where we're seeing a lot of AI applications. AI is being used for fraud detection. Uh, it can analyze a number of financial transactions, uh, contracts, and other things, and look for unusual behavior, uh, look for the outliers, and then subject them to human inspection to see if there actually is a problem. Uh, retail is a, a growing area where there are several different kinds of uh, technologies uh, coming into place. Uh, Amazon, for example, has opened a number of retail stores that are fully automated. Uh, you basically uh, walk in through a turnstile, uh, you have the Amazon app on your phone, uh, it reads uh, your identity uh, through uh, that app, 
you go shopping, uh, it uses computer vision to see what items uh, you are taking, and then it automatically charges your credit card or your mobile payment system. So literally, you walk in and walk out without dealing with any clerks, uh, any uh, cash registers, or uh, anything else. Uh, the last example I'll give is just in terms of e-commerce and product uh, recommendations. And here, the AI analyzes what people are doing online, uh, what they buy, what they don't buy, what they look at uh, but don't uh, purchase, and it'll make recommendations uh, for you. Uh, and Amazon, for example, uh, suggests that almost a third of their purchases now are based on their recommendations for you. And so if you think about that, what that means is Amazon's AI can figure out what you want before you actually know uh, what you want. So you can see that AI is being deployed in uh, many uh, different areas. It takes a lot of different forms, uh, but it's really the algorithm and the software that learns and adapts that is the key feature of all of these uh, examples. There are many worries about artificial intelligence these days in terms of fairness, uh, bias, equity, uh, human safety, lack of uh, transparency. Uh, so we uh, talk about them and how it's playing out in education and healthcare in other areas. Uh, there are basic governance questions in terms of who decides. Like right now, for the last 30 years, America has had a libertarian stance on technology innovation, where we basically delegate almost all the major decisions to the tech companies. Like they decide what products to develop, what kinds of innovations to pursue, uh, uh, when they come on the market, to whom they uh, sell. I mean, there's very little regulation in the technology uh, area. Uh, but it raises a lot of concern over whether we, the people, actually should play a bigger role, whether there should be more oversight, uh, more uh, public engagement, uh, and uh, more uh, regulation. Uh, there actually is a growing tech lash uh, in the technology area. Like if you look at public opinion uh, surveys, there's a lot of concern about different aspects of uh, technology, uh, privacy, uh, security, uh, the impact on human safety. Uh, the Edelman Trust uh, barometer has found more than 60% uh, believe technology is advancing too quickly. Uh, people are worried that online uh, we can no longer distinguish the real from the fake, and we're see certainly seeing problems with that uh, in our current election campaign. Uh, the tech lash is manifest at the state and local level in rising regulation about technology. Uh, so several communities already have banned the use of facial recognition uh, software uh, for uh, law enforcement uh, in particular. Uh, some communities uh, are imposing uh, restrictions on Airbnb rentals uh, that they don't want uh, areas that are primarily residential to basically become commercial establishments uh, through uh, uh, people renting uh, their homes. Uh, there are new rules for the gig economy. California has been in the forefront of that in terms of uh, placing new rules on who gets counted as an employee and how do you classify independent contractors uh, who typically uh, don't get uh, benefits. Uh, and then California also has passed a major privacy uh, law as well. Uh, internationally, there's a lot of fear about the use of AI-based technology for mass surveillance. Uh, certainly, there's a lot of concern about what's going on in China, how technology is uh, being uh, deployed uh, there. Uh, one of my favorite examples was there's a guy who was wanted by the local police uh, in China. Uh, he was laying low because obviously he didn't want to be uh, uh, found uh, by the police. But one weekend, he decided to go to a concert in a large stadium where there were 75,000 people. And he obviously thought because of the large numbers, the police would not be able to pick him out of the crowd. And of course, what he neglected was uh, the ubiquity of video cameras there, the use of facial recognition software, and then AI that can basically process a large amount of information almost instantly, and they found him at that concert and arrested him. So uh, people are worried uh, uh, kind of how other countries are starting to use uh, technology, uh, how bad practices are migrating to the United States. Uh, and so we're starting to see uh, more percolation of uh, regulation at the uh, local uh, level. And we do believe uh, that next year, uh, some of what is happening at the local level is going to start to migrate to the national uh, level. Congress so far has been relatively silent 
on the tech regulation, but there are a lot of new bills uh, that have been introduced. Uh, the House Antitrust Subcommittee held a series of hearings uh, you know, a month ago. They had the CEOs of the four major uh, tech uh, platforms uh, testify, uh, and it was clear from the questioning there was a lot of concern both among Republicans and Democrats about uh, different aspects of the uh, tech sector. So the good news is, in some ways, our book is an optimistic vision about technology, because even though there are a lot of things going wrong and a lot of problems that already have been identified, there are things that we can do about it. I think people's greatest fear about technology is the loss of human control. We worry that the technology is advancing to the point where it is in control and we no longer are in control. But if you look at the history of technology, that almost never is the case. There always are new technologies that come along. Uh, they have certain benefits, but they generate a, a number of problems. It takes a while for society to kind of wake up and figure out how to address those problems, but then there always are laws, policies, and regulations that, uh, that address uh, the more worrisome uh, aspects of uh, those uh, technologies. We're in the early stages of that process in regard to AI and many other uh, types of emerging uh, technologies, but I'm confident that that is going to happen that the next 30 years are gonna look very different from the last 30 years in terms of the governance models, the policies, and the uh, regulations. So in our book, uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about how to deal with uh, various uh, problems. Uh, from the private company standpoint, we have a number of recommendations in terms of what they can be doing uh, differently, just in terms of incorporating ethics into their product design, uh, hiring ethicists. Some companies have developed AI review panels, uh, where the product designers have to go before an internal review board, present their product, explain how it operates, anticipate uh, possible problems, and then kind of figure out how they will deal with those uh, problems. Uh, there are lots of uh, things that companies could do to make a difference. Uh, and we definitely encourage uh, companies to move in those directions and incorporate those types of uh, ethical issues in their uh, operations. But private company action is not gonna be sufficient. Uh, we have a, a lot of information in our book on what we call a policy blueprint for moving forward with uh, technology. So we have a number of ideas. I'll just uh, summarize uh, three or four of them and then I'd be happy to answer any questions that uh, people have. Uh, one idea is to uh, develop what we call AI impact statements. And these are modeled after the environmental impact statements from 50 years ago. In the 1970s, when economic development was uh, taking off and people were uh, worrying about the environment, the national government imposed the requirement of an environmental impact statement uh, in which the company had to talk about the development project that it had underway, what the possible environmental consequences were, and then they had to talk about how they were gonna mitigate those adverse consequences. We think the same type of idea should be applied today with AI and other emerging uh, technologies, that for publicly funded projects that affect a large number of people, that uh, the developers should address uh, what their product is doing, the possible ramifications for people, how it's going to affect society, and how we can mitigate the adverse uh, consequences of uh, that. Uh, it's a desire to become more proactive in terms of dealing with uh, tech problems because right now, the way we do it is the tech companies develop products, they put them out in the world, eventually problems start to pop up, and then one or two years later, we figure out, oh my God, there's a problem, how do we deal with it? That is way too late. We have to do all of that much earlier in the process. We have to anticipate the problems. We have to be proactive. We have to think uh, much more aggressively about how to deal with some of the uh, negative uh, consequences. One of the particular biases that we worry about in the technology area and with AI in particular is the issue of fairness and bias and discrimination. Uh, there already are known problems in each of those areas Facial recognition, for example, works much better on Caucasian faces than minority faces. Uh, the accuracy levels actually are pretty high 
uh, for white people, uh, they are about 30 percentage points lower for minority individuals. And part of it is the images on which those facial recognition systems have been trained tend to overrepresent white people as opposed to minority people. And so there's a problem with the training data used to uh, teach uh, the facial recognition system. So uh, there's that problem. Uh, there are problems of bias in the finance area where people are applying for mortgages, people are applying for uh, credit, and there are AI algorithms that are now evaluating people's credit worthiness. Now, with traditional banks and financial institutions, they are prohibited by federal law from incorporating race, gender, and marital status in the decision making. Uh, they uh, are, are not allowed to uh, incorporate those types of things. But in an AI world, the algorithm does not have to incorporate race, gender, or marital status, but because people's online behavior, their consumer purchases, the TV shows they watch, the movies they uh, watch, the magazine subscriptions they hold reveal so much about them, you can develop proxy measures for race, gender, and marital status, and therefore use those items in making credit decisions, even if you're not explicitly uh, addressing uh, race, gender, or marital status. So uh, there are possible biases. There can be examples of what we call digital redlining, where uh, financial institutions using uh, AI algorithms end up being biased against uh, women, uh, minorities, uh, uh, or uh, single people uh, and making unfair credit uh, decisions and denying credit uh, to people. Uh, and so we need to figure out uh, ways to uh, deal with uh, those types of issues. So in the book, uh, we talk about the importance of migrating some of our current anti-bias and anti-discrimination uh, uh, laws to the digital economy. Uh, and there are lots of complications in uh, doing that and how you ascertain uh, the disparate impact on people, how you uh, deal with intent when it's an algorithm making the uh, decision as opposed to a human being. Uh, but we need to get a handle on uh, that uh, type of uh, situation. Uh, we need to uh, take privacy very seriously. Uh, our current approach to uh, privacy based on notice and consent is completely inadequate. Uh, we have lots of ideas on uh, ways we can uh, move uh, beyond that. So there are lots of different problems uh, with AI, but there are ways that we can handle each and every one of those uh, problems. We can come up with new rules, new policies, and new regulations that address a lot of those uh, questions. Uh, why don't I stop at, at this point? I'd be happy to take any uh, comments that people have uh, here, uh, any uh, questions, or if uh, Caltech students want to argue, uh, I'm happy to do that. I taught at Brown University for a number of years, argued with my students all the time. So happy to uh, deal with any questions that you have. Um, yes, yeah, so just a reminder, um, everyone. Oh, it uh, looks like uh, Eduardo has a question. Is there a way, Greg, to, uh, I, I think 